The new Neil Young and Crazy Horse record, or I should say Neil Young with Crazy Horse, it is another album in a long line of albums by Neil Young that have come out in the past several years. He started his Archives project back around 2008. It's yielded two box sets, Archives Volume 1 and Volume 2. There's a third one on the way, supposedly by the end of the year. And he has an Archives website, which is super in-depth. You can go through the filing cabinet, you know, pull up a song, listen to it in lossless audio, look at all the pictures and memorabilia associated with it, link out to other versions of the song. Very comprehensive, has all kinds of uh, concerts too that, uh, that weren't officially released. But Archives also has put out, Neil Young Archives has also put out a lot of standalone albums um, that are coming out all the time, kind of what I, I referred to. Uh, one of these is the new Neil Young with Crazy Horse record, Early Days. This record is, this record surprised me. First of all, I'm not immune to Neil Young overload. Um, I don't like to necessarily buy everything that he puts out, especially if I've already heard a lot of it through the archive site or, or other places, although I, I do tend to get most of them. But this Early Days album I initially streamed and I was pretty blown away. Why was I blown away? Because much like the cover on this record where you see Danny Witten in the foreground, the album sounds like that too. He is in the foreground. You really hear what this guy was capable of. You hear how he's on equal levels with Neil Young vocally, how they complement each other, um, the guitar interplay the songwriting. I mean, there's a song on here that, that Danny R Witten wrote by himself. There's also Come On Baby, Let's Go Downtown, which he wrote. And you just hear all these songs that could have been um, on another record. I mean, they recorded Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere, this core lineup. And three of these songs were outtakes from that, from those sessions. Cinnamon Girl, Down By The River, and Calgary on the Sand. They're different takes. I mean, at one point, somebody says, maybe it was Neil, take 14. It's like, he did 14 takes of a song? I, it might be probably the last time he did that, right? Uh, they really worked hard on that record. And somewhere along the line, um, Danny Witten started to become very undependable because of problems with drugs, namely heroin. But it, probably before that happened, they had another recording session in 1969. And this was probably to make the third or the second, third Neil Young record, the third, um, the second Neil Young with Crazy Horse record. And so many songs on this record behind me are songs, studio cuts that probably were intended for that record, like Wondering and Winter Long and Dance, 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 Everyone's Alone. Come on, baby, let's go downtown. There's a Danny Witten original on there. Um, what's, what's the title of that one? I have it. It's also on the Crazy Horse record that came out later. It's uh, Look at All the Things. That one really blew me away, honestly, when that came out on, on the record. Because I don't know that Crazy Horse record like super well. I was really blown away by it. Just blown away by how much of a celebration it is of this guy. But yeah, he became a heroin addict. Uh, increasingly difficult to work with. I guess recording what became the third Neil Young record after the gold rush was quite a chore, getting him in there, getting him in there when he was not using, when he could make reliable takes. And so the, the album's kind of split. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, singer-songwriter kind of stripped down stuff. The heavy influence of CSN is on there. He had just been on tour with them. But also you have some Crazy Horse songs on there. It's... Um, it's basically a Crazy Horse record with guests. That's how it's built if you flip over the record. But you have, you know, Southern Man, you have uh, uh, When You Dance You Can Really Love and a few other songs where they are used. And if they're not used, their members are used kind of interchangeably and on different songs. But apparently um, Danny came in at kind of the last minute when they were recording that to do more work on it and ended up replacing Stephen Stills and other background singers' parts so that he could, um, he did a much better job and Neil used Danny's parts. But he became a very heavy heroin user and they were having a lot of problems. 
Anyway, Neil goes to Nashville and he makes Harvest and Danny Witten is not part of that. There is a song that um, references Danny Witten, unfortunately, The Needle and the Damage Done, because already uh, it was really, really sad what was happening to him and Neil was picking up on it. So Harvest explodes. It becomes his number one record of the year in 1972. And Neil is uh, you know, going to tour and he's going to play the biggest places he's ever played. And so he starts working with Danny Witten to try to get him in shape. Supposedly he had kicked heroin, trying to get him to be the guitar player on this major upcoming tour. And supposedly he worked with him a lot, but on that last, uh, the eve of the tour, um, he had to make a call and Danny just wasn't cutting it. And he told him so and gave him, I believe it was a bus ticket and $50 and uh, sent him on his way. And Danny made some comment about now what do I I don't know what to do you know he must have realized that his band the Rockets was over and Crazy Horse I think had kicked him out at that point too the standalone band Crazy Horse who did put out this record in the interim when all this was going on and he went home and was found dead that night or the next morning um it wasn't a heroin overdose. Most people think it was. I thought that too. Apparently it was alcohol and Valium, the combination and the abuse he had, he had, um, that had, had wreaked havoc on his body too. But yeah, imagine Neil Young having to go on tour right after this happens and the enormous guilt that he felt. So he goes on tour. It's a real ragged kind of affair. He has this hired band. Apparently there are a lot of issues with compensation and lots of infighting and just wasn't a very good experience and Neil was probably his head was in another place he featured all new songs on at least a good portion of the show and he ended up releasing that as time fades away kind of the first of the ditch trilogy there's also another version of that album on the archive site from I believe a later either earlier or later uh, show and then as soon as he gets back uh, from that tour, he pulls together the members, the remaining members of Crazy Horse, brings in Jack Nitsche, and brings in Nils Lofgren, and makes the album that I think was the introduction to who is Danny Witten for a lot of us, Tonight's a Night, which was like a wake for him, a, um, a tribute to him. I mean, my introduction was probably this line. I think it was on a CD, but this album was made for Danny Witten and Bruce Berry, who lived and died for rock and roll. You know, in pre-internet times, I'm not sure I knew that the crazy horse of uh, Zuma, or, or I probably didn't have Zuma yet, the crazy horse of Russ Never Sleeps was any different than the crazy horse of Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere. So they make this album, a lot of us gets to turn on to who Danny Witten is and his story, and it's incredibly sad. And this this ghost of Danny Witten really, I think, haunts Neil. He feels responsible for all this. And... I don't know. You you always wonder what, what could have been with um, Danny Witten, or at least I do after hearing the album behind me. Uh, clearly a creative partner with him, a partnership that he probably never had again in his life. I, For me, uh, Jay Bennett to Jeff Tweedy kind of comes to mind, like this creative person you're really working with until something happens. I also think of Sid Barrett, as far as uh, haunting a band, um, just having that hang over you. I mean, Pink Floyd were directly or indirectly referencing or influenced by Sid Barrett's life story on most, if not all, of those uh, albums from Dark Side to the Wall. I mean, you know, just powerful, powerful stuff. And yeah, who knows if we would have had the Ditch trilogy? Who knows what Neil's mental health would have been? Um, had Danny Witten survived but I really love this record because it celebrates Danny Witten by hearing all those songs with the vocals turned up and the harmonies and going back to everybody knows this is nowhere and for me you know paying more attention to the crazy horse record um, the song to listen to on here if you've not heard it is I don't want to talk about it just a beautiful beautiful song he wrote that later became a big hit for for Rod Stewart after he passed away. Um, a pretty good album. I, I don't know if it's a, a great album. I think it suffers a little bit from having too many competing voices on there. You know, Nils Lofgren sings a song, so does Jack Nietzsche. And 
uh, split songwriting uh, on some songs. But Danny Witten is a dominant voice on this, and, and it is really cool to hear him. And I must say, I like this album a lot more since I heard the one behind me, and I plan on going back to it. But what an incredible story. There's also rumors, or apparently it's not a rumor, that he did some demos after uh, Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere and after he got kicked out of Crazy Horse after after this record. And nobody's really heard those songs. So I always wonder who has ownership of that stuff. If Neil would have ownership of that, you know, if he or he could find and get permission to put that stuff out. I'm just kind of to a point now where I want to hear all there is um, about Danny Witten. Um, but check out this record if you haven't. It's it's really interesting. It's really important. And I don't know if you're like me, it's going to kind of make you look at that whole beginning crazy horse period um, through a new lens. Thanks.